Minister, thank you very much for your time. There's a lot to talk about. Uh, there is uh, Syria, there is uh, North Korea, there's China, there's Ukraine, there's ISIS. Um, but inevitably, I I'd like to begin by talking to you about uh, Russian-US uh, uh, relations. Um, there are pictures of you with the Obama administration in which uh, you uh, look unhappy. <laughs> Uh, there are pictures of you with President Trump in which you look like you're having fun. So what? <laughs> is, that, that, is that the way it is? I, it, haven't have... seen, I haven't seen any picture of me which could be described uh, as me being happy or unhappy. Uh, if I laugh, then the gentleman who talks to me uh, might have cracked a joke. If I don't laugh, uh, the partner might be boring or a partner might be asking for some serious issue to be considered, and then I'm not laughing. Uh, but with John Kerry, for example, we laughed a lot. Uh, he, had, uh, he has, I hope, uh, still very good humor, and uh, we enjoyed uh, our private relations uh, as much as we uh, concentrated on our uh, business on Syria and uh, elsewhere. If there is a warmer relationship now with the uh, Trump administration than there have been with previous American administrations. There are also uh, messages from Moscow that are unhappy with things, particularly the uh, Russian compounds that were seized by the Americans. Uh, what is the real feeling towards uh, Washington as you would describe it right now? Do you, are, are there particular people within the administration that you think are more constructive to Russia than others? Do you, for example, think that President Trump <clears throat> has a more positive attitude towards Russia uh, than Secretary Tillerson, for example? Look, we can only rely on what people say and what people do. Uh, and uh, it's obvious that during the Obama administration, uh, the uh, irritation for whatever reason, uh, started building up in Washington against us many years ago, uh, long before uh, Ukrainian crisis, long before anything else which is now cited as the problem in Russian-American relations. Uh, the first time I think uh, it was uh, publicly shown was when uh, Edward Snowden uh, made it to Russia. Uh, in the expectation that he would be able to take uh, a flight to Latin America, and Russia was just a stopover. As he was flying from China to Russia, his uh, passport was declared invalid, and this information was circulated to the airports all over the world, including to the Moscow airport, where he landed and could not be let through because of the information received about his passport. And then President Obama called President Putin, John Kerry called me, uh, John Brennan called his counterpart in Moscow all, many, many times, saying you must, you must extradite him, you must extradite him. Uh, and uh, according to our legislation, we cannot extradite people who are being persecuted for something they did uh, to protect and promote human rights. And then uh, President Obama, uh, I would say entirely unpresidentially, uh, was uh, frustrated so much that he cancelled uh, his bilateral visit to Moscow, which was scheduled immediately uh, on the eve of the St. Petersburg G20 summit. He did attend the summit in St. Petersburg, but he did cancel uh, the visit, which was supposed to consider quite important agenda. I believe it is not for the people who occupy any position of, influ of influence and importance in the current world uh, to get offended like uh, small kids uh, on issues. Uh, which are absolutely uncomparable uh, to the issues which had to be discussed, which were to be discussed at the Russian-American summit. And then, of course, the Magnitsky law, uh, which, as we now see, uh, was um, uh, very much orchestrated. But I, I hope the investigation which is going on, including in the United States, uh, would uh, discover the truth. Uh, all this was long before Ukraine. Uh, and all this was uh, accumulated by the Obama administration building on, I would say, some uh, personal agendas. 
uh, maybe President Obama was personally offended by something uh, he saw in Russia. And then uh, at the last days of his administration, he uh, seized the diplomatic property protected by bilateral uh, agreements between our countries uh, and uh, enjoying a diplomatic immunity. Uh, I believe it was, um, you know, the, the act of uh, desperation and the desire um, to leave uh, something to his successor, uh, which would be unrepairable as far as Russian-American relations are concerned. So it was not, uh, it was not uh, this administration's act. It was an act designed, uh, among other things, uh, which were uh, promoted to make the life of this administration uh, absolutely unbearable. Uh, and uh, we always knew, of course, from the history of the American state, uh, from many wars which were fought on that land, uh, that seizure of property, seizure of land, uh, was one of the means uh, how America was created, actually. But I never suspected that this would be done by a party uh, which uh, now represents a uh, quite different philosophy. By the way, uh, when people say that the property was arrested and diplomats were expelled, to punish Russia for meddling with the American election, uh, don't believe uh, this crap because the official note per ball which we received from the State Department said nothing about the reasons for which this property had been seized. So it's just uh, uh, straightforward robbery. And uh, international law uh, is entirely on our side and we would uh, act on the basis of international law to get it back. You're threatening to uh, <coughs> remove U.S. diplomats from Russia. Uh, is that <coughs> what message should the U.S. take away? Do you see President Trump as a friend, or uh, are your are the your declarations, your public declarations, that you may still expel U.S. diplomats? Is is that? your posture towards the U.S.? Well, uh, we uh, perceive President Trump uh, for what he is saying publicly, uh, expressing his position vis-a-vis -vis Russia, saying that the two biggest uh, nuclear powers must uh, do everything in order to cooperate to resolve the matters which only uh, can be resolved through their cooperation. And this was confirmed not only during his campaign, in his uh, public statements, but also during uh, three phone conversations and the direct meeting with President Putin in Hamburg on the 7th of July. And we have no reason to believe that his desire to promote the interest of the United States and the interest of making this world safer, together with Russia, on the basis of our cooperation, on the basis of the balance of interests, uh, that this desire is sincere, I have no reason to doubt it. As for the uh, situation in which he found himself, uh, I don't think he is uh, being attacked uh, because of what happened uh, between him and Russia in the media, uh, how this all was perceived. I believe it was a shock for the establishment in the United States uh, after the results of the election were announced. Uh, and uh, somebody who was not part of the system, uh, of the system of government. Uh, yes, he was part of the uh, business system of the United States, but not part of the system of government, got elected unexpectedly. Uh, and uh, this entire uh, avalanche of attacks, uh, of accusations, uh, absolutely groundless, at least uh, as far as the Russian angle of this, of this uh, anti-Trump campaign is concerned. We haven't seen any single fact during many, many months of accusations. Some uh, facts are being uh, hidden uh, by public explanation that they're secret, uh, but I cannot uh, imagine that with uh, the experience of CIA, uh, National Security Agency, FBI, and many other intelligence and uh, uh, special services uh, in the United States, there are no experts who can uh, present to the public the facts the way which would not compromise the sources. <laughs> if this is the case, then the, there is no single professional in all these 17 structures. I cannot just believe in it. 
so the fight goes on. Uh, they want to make the life of this administration miserable. Uh, people try to speak about impeachment, we read about this, but frankly, I read the news from the United States less and less. It's a fight, uh, though, you think? It's a fight uh, for it's, President it's Trump? It's absolutely a fight, uh, but as I said, I... Uh, and, and Russia is on President Trump's side? No, we are on the side of justice. Right. Be it, be it uh, the two duchess who want international law to be respected, uh, be it the internal development of any country, including the United States, we want the constitution of that particular country to be respected, as, as well as international obligations of that country. We, we know about uh, President Putin and President Trump meeting three times at the G20. They, they met, obviously, for the bilateral, they met at the dinner, and they met... Well, when maybe they, they went to a toilet together. That was a forced time. They met also when they were photographed shaking hands. That's my question. Did they meet other times in the hallways? Were there other occasions when they met? I, I, thought, I thought it was already understood by the people who are uh, mature and grown up. But I keep hearing uh, from very solid uh, media outlets, they met secretly. When? Uh, at a dinner, which was attended by some hundred persons, right. not to mention waiters, not to mention uh, assistants who were not uh, allowed to the table, but who were waiting in the uh, margins of that room. And that was... Uh, I mean, something which people do. So they may uh, have met why, the why, why nobody, why nobody uh, got uh, suspicious uh, of the fact that actually the entire dinner uh, Putin spent with uh, Madame Trump, with the First Lady, uh, because the German hosts uh, arranged the table that way. And then after the dinner was over, I, and I was not there. President Trump apparently went up to pick up his wife and uh, spend some minutes with President Putin. So what? And they did shake hands, uh, which was now listed as a third meeting. Right. And I don't know about the, the men's room, uh, as I told you. But, but did they meet in hallways? Did they, meet on the, did they have other conversations? Are you aware? Look, foreign ministers are not invited uh, to the uh, um, sessions of the G20 discussions. We only uh, were present at the bilaterals, uh, which the president had with uh, many of his uh, colleagues, uh, the leaders attending the uh, G20 summit. But uh, when you are brought uh, by your ch uh, parents to a kindergarten, do you mix with the people who are waiting in the same room to start going to a class classroom? I believe you. I remember when I was in that position, uh, I did spend five, ten minutes in the kindergarten before they brought us to the classroom to start explaining to us uh, how the animals differ, you know. It's, it's the G20, though, not a kindergarten. Uh, well, but there is also a room where they get together before an event starts. They cannot arrive uh, uh, all at the same time in a bus. They arrive with their own uh, motorcades, and then they are uh, ushered in a room, where, which is a waiting room. So they might have met even much more than just three times. It's an important point, though, and, and this is why, and I would think it would be an important point from your point of view, which is that when important leaders like President Trump and President Putin, some of the most important leaders in the world, meet, they make agreements which then uh, your people who work for you have to then implement. Um, let me give you an example. Uh, in terms of the working group on cybersecurity, uh, the Russia's envoy on cybersecurity says that there are now discussions underway with the US. President Trump has tweeted that actually it can't happen. That appears to have been something that was agreed at the bilateral meeting, but it's not clear because we don't appear to have an objective readout of what was agreed. So, so is that working group on cybersecurity happening? And I guess my wider question is, does it actually make it more difficult for you? Russia is said to have asked for a note taker at that meeting and, and, and the White House is said to have refuse that. Does it actually make it more, is that not true? Is that not? There were two interpreters, each on each side. Okay. So does it, does it make it more difficult for you if there isn't a clear agreement of, of, on what was agreed at each meeting, a, a formal agreement? Well, and and, and uh, what about that cyber uh, working group? It's, it's very schematic, you know, uh, the way you presented this question, unfortunately. Uh, when the leaders discuss, they don't draft documents. They don't draft papers. 
they pick up subjects on which they believe uh, the two countries uh, can cooperate uh, for the benefit of their own people, for the benefit of security in the region and in the world. And they did discuss cybersecurity. President Trump raised this issue. He said that he clearly remembers, uh, remembered what President Putin publicly said, answering the questions uh, about whether Russia meddled with the US elections, and the answer was no. But he also reminded, as he did during this uh, meeting in Hamburg, uh, that uh, the Russian Federation many times, many years ago, still under the Obama administration, proposed to establish a serious process which would concentrate on any apprehensions, any of us, and maybe some others, because this could have been open uh, for other countries to join, any apprehensions which anyone might have regarding the regarding any problem in cyberspace. It was the Russian Federation together with China, with uh, other members of the Shanghai Cooperation Organization, uh, who many years ago, several years ago, uh, proposed a draft uh, document uh, called, um, you know, Rules of Behavior in Cyberspace, and this is available in the United Nations. It was the Obama administration which was not very eager about start, uh, starting right. to discuss it, and we just recalled all this when all these accusations started uh, being thrown at the Trump administration and at the Russian Federation that we uh, intrigued uh, yeah. behind the uh, curtains, under the carpets, you know, to defeat Democrats. We reiterated uh, this uh, approach that we want cyberspace to be uh, the area where we discuss all concerns be it uh, interference in domestic affairs of any sovereign state, be it the use of cyberspace for terrorist purposes or for the purposes of drug uh, business, uh, pedophilia, other violations of international and national legislation. And the President of the United States clearly showed interest in having this in, in having these issues discussed. That's and, the, what, and those talks are underway now, are they, with the US well, on cyber I, security? I cannot I cannot be uh, in the picture on each and every uh, aspects of our experts' right. context. So you're, the Russian Russia's envoy on cybersecurity says there are talks underway between the US. That's and what he said yesterday. Yeah. Yes, is that's yeah. correct. Well, you ask me. Uh, to say whether I trust somebody <laughs> who is an official in charge of cyber security. Right. If you don't trust him, double check with somebody else. He is my subordinate. I don't have any uh, reason not to trust him. Yeah. The, the, on those conversations, initially you said that President Trump mentioned the question, the allegation of Russian intervention in the US elections. And then later President Putin said uh, that uh, President Trump asked him the question directly, and it wasn't a singular question. There were many questions, and, and, and that President Trump gave much attention to that subject. Did, did Moscow change the description from the way that you characterized it in order to help President Trump? Did Moscow increase the amount of conversation that it, it, it said was, was there about uh, the allegations of Russian intervention in the U.S. election. I, I uh, feel like I am at the hearing uh, in the Senate uh, on the investigation of Trump uh, uh, betraying the interests of the United States of America. Uh, but no, uh, President Trump actually himself answered to the allegations that uh, he uh, trusted uh, Putin, as Putin said. He clearly reminded uh, all those uh, who have nothing better to do uh, than to engage in this uh, dirty business, that what President Putin uh, said about uh, this part of the discussion at the press conference, uh, that uh, President Trump raised the issue, President Putin uh, confirmed that we never did anything to interfere in the American elections, and that he, President Putin, uh, got an impression that President Trump accepted this uh, explanation. He never, Putin never said that Trump was happy about uh, something he said on this call. Right. And I read the tweet of President Trump, uh, and I believe uh, uh, the courage with which he uh, <laughs> withstand this uh, unbelievable uh, uh, attacks uh, uh, is, is really uh, deserves 
does deserve respect. But uh, any anything else about cyber security? <laughs> I got a broader question actually because you, you are a. You are a diplomat of many, many years' experience, one of the most experienced diplomats in the world. And yet, in recent months, you have been witness to some moments of, of history. What goes through your mind when you're there in the room as President Putin meets President Trump? What goes through your mind when you're in the Oval Office with President Trump and he uh, talks about having great intel and allegedly uh, to share some of that with you or describes James Comey as a, as a nut job. These things are not experiences that even you uh, have every day. Uh, you mean what I felt when I was in the Oval Office? What did you feel? Basically, I, the feeling was the same uh, as when I was in the Oval Office with President Obama and President Bush before him respect to the president who was legitimately elected the leader of the United States on the basis of the United States Constitution and respect for anything uh, they choose to tell me uh, to present the American position and to present uh, their views on what they believe should be the substance of Russian American relations. And at the G20 when the two presidents are meeting for and uh, uh, apparently President Trump's wife even came into the room to say we need to wrap this up and, and but it was going so well they wanted to carry on. Look, uh, our uh, political and human culture uh, does not provide for somebody else's family matters to be discussed in public. But I, my question is really more about just... I understand you are British, you are too, too eager to get more details uh, than uh, uh, Russians can provide to you on this uh, human rights uh, subject, but... You don't want to share more about what happened. It's a two-hour meeting and we know very little about what really happened. No, no, no. You asked for the, for the uh, entry of the First Lady right. and I answered you. Right. And uh, I believe the 30 minutes or, or, some, or so which we are discussing we have been discussing mostly that meeting in Hamburg. What is your specific... Uh, uh, I'm just interested in your reflections on, on that meeting, on that meeting well, it was the, 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 the meeting of the two leaders. Mm. And actually, I uh, did make uh, a statement after that meeting. Yes. Uh, before the uh, con press conference of President Putin, that was a meeting of the two leaders uh, who certainly uh, defend the interests of their countries who understand the interests of their countries uh, in a long-term uh, perspective, not just thinking of, you know, what comes in a year and a half, mid-term elections, we have to maneuver. Uh, no, they have been uh, clearly guided by long-term interest of the United States and of the Russian Federation. And they were clearly both very much aware uh, that uh, the best interest of our countries uh, require or would be or rather would be much much better uh, ensured if we cooperate and if we uh, also cooperate on issues which are important to the entire world and which could be much more effectively resolved if Russia and the United States are together as as it happens uh, uh, in some parts of Syria now on Syria do you view the... Oh, by the way, you, you said that President Trump revealed some secret when I was in the Oval Office. I missed that part of your question, did mm -hmm. you? There's an allegation that he did, obviously, which you'll know about. Uh, but uh, he was accused uh, of telling me a secret uh, about uh, something which was discovered by special services uh, and which related to the ability of terrorists to manipulate with uh, smartphones and notebooks the way which would allow the explosive to be, to be placed uh, in those uh, devices. Uh, he just mentioned that terrorists are be have become very inventive and creative. But this very statement was made publicly, either by FBI or by CIA, uh, CIA about a month before I entered the Oval Office. And it was not only announced publicly, it was the reason 
why uh, passengers from some countries in the Middle East were officially, legally prohibited uh, to carry these kind of devices on board the planes, exactly because of that reason. When, so when this was cited as, as a secret, top secret, revealed uh, to me by President Trump, uh, I really uh, did not believe that serious people could, could uh, make this kind of allegation. On uh, Syria, do you view uh, the reporting that the CIA program to back uh, Syrian rebels in Russia, uh, that, that, is a, that that has been stopped, that that program will no longer go forward, do you view that as a concession to what Russia is asking for in Syria? The well, look, this, was, this, was, this decision was taken as far as American media writes, uh, if you still can believe the American media, uh, but I still try to. Uh, and uh, this decision was made a uh, few weeks before uh, the meeting of G20. I read, I think, yesterday that this was a result of a meeting between President Trump, General McMaster, uh, and uh, Secretary Mattis. Uh, I can only proceed from this, uh, from this uh, news. Do you welcome it? I don't know, uh, because we have to calculate uh, the overall approach of all of us uh, to resolving the Syrian crisis. Uh, we certainly concentrated on the de-escalation zones, de-escalation areas, which are designed uh, to stop the fighting between the government and the armed opposition, uh, for them not to attack each other, and hopefully for them to concentrate entirely on fighting ISIL. Therefore, the, the logic of the opposition and the government uh, to, uh, to, to, to sign a ceasefire, to enter into cessation of hostilities arrangement, is very much uh, our logic. And uh, I understand that the United States uh, supports much more uh, groups than just the ones uh, which were announced as uh, uh, being left without the American uh, weapons and instructors, uh, and that, uh, well, lately it was stated that some 10 American bases have been created in Syria. At least the, a Turkish newspaper wrote about this, and the Americans criticized Turkey for having allowed this news to be, to be let out. Uh, 10 bases. I don't know. I, I, I only trust what I what I uh, see uh, in the news uh, and take it for the, for the, for the value of what but it is. You, you object to that, do you, American bases in Syria? No, I don't object to American bases in Syria as long as the Americans uh, reiterate that their illegitimate presence in the Syrian Arab Republic, because unlike us, they were not invited illegitimate. by the government. Of you course say it, they're of not, course it is they shouldn't be mm -hmm. As long as this illegitimate uh, presence in the Syrian Arab Republic is... Uh, uh, executed in the way which they say is the case, namely with the full respect of sovereignty and territorial integrity of the, Syria, of the Syrian Arab Republic, uh, with the sole purpose to fight ISIL and other terrorist organizations. And it, th that means that after the uh, country has been liberated, after the settlement has been reached to the satisfaction of all the Syrian ethnic, confessional and political groups, uh, the presence uh, of the foreign uh, troops or foreign bases on the soil of Syria would be only legitimate with the consent of the Syrians themselves. But uh, uh, it was interesting for me to, to read uh, just this, just the, just about, the, about the, the presence and the bases. But I just wanted it to was say interesting, excuse me. Okay, I'm sorry. It was interesting to me to read the statement, I think this morning, of, uh, of Mr. Pompeo, the CIA director. He was asked about uh, what Russia is doing in Syria, and he said, we don't like what Russia is doing in Syria. We don't share the purposes of Russian presence in Syria. The main purpose of, uh, of Russian presence is to establish a couple of bases uh, on the uh, Mediterranean uh, sea seashore. Uh, and that was presented as something uh, which we <laughs> don't deserve. <laughs> so if the gentleman who represents a country uh, illegitimately uh, uh, having created 10 bases in Syria is concerned very much about two bases which are, have been established on the basis of our intergovernmental agreement with the government 
which is the member of the United Nations. Then something is uh, wrong with uh, double standards. To be, to be not to mention, not to mention that uh, uh, hundreds and hundreds of military bases of the United States all over the world and all around Russia uh, seemingly do not cause any concern to Mr. Pompeo or to, any, to, to anybody else. To be clear, the principle that the only forces that should be allowed mm -hmm. to intervene in Syria are those that have been uh, sanctioned by President Assad would suggest that only Russia, Iran and perhaps Hezbollah should be allowed to intervene in Syria? Uh, well, strictly speaking, yes. But in practical terms, uh, we have been trying uh, to be flexible in order to remove the key uh, barrier to the Syrian settlement, the terrorist threat in Syria. And uh, through our dealings with Iran and Turkey, by the way, uh, we, uh, and through our dealings with Jordan and the United States, and with the armed opposition, we try to achieve this, this, this goal by having a cessation of hostilities between the government and those who fight it on the part of the uh, patriotic opposition, so that all forces can be released free to fight terrorists. And the, process which, the processes which we are engaged in, of course they have been consulted with the Syrian government, and the Syrian government does not mind us to move in the direction we are moving in the context of the overall understanding that number one priority is to fight ISIL. And we hope very much that this de-escalation areas agreement uh, would resolve the problem uh, which killed the deal between us and President Obama, namely the problem of Jabhat al-Nusra and all its incarnations. Because from the very beginning, the United States a coalition uh, while fighting ISIL uh, more or less uh, actively, sometimes more, sometimes less, they have been sparing Jabhat al-Nusra, obviously. All facts indicate in this direction. And by the way, uh, this was the reason why the deal between myself and John Kerry, uh, endorsed by President Obama and President Putin, failed in September last year, because the deal was that the Syrian Air Force does not fly at all, that the Russian Air Force and the uh, American coalition fly and hit only those targets which would be mutually agreed. It was, it was a huge deal, uh, but the, the, the deal uh, should enter into force on the seven days uh, and by the seven of the deal, uh, by the seven day, the Obama administration committed itself to separate the opposition, uh, which is patriotic, from Jabhat al-Nusra. I'm, I'm, and, they, and they failed, and they said so, which only confirmed our suspicion that they were protecting Nusra uh, all, all along. I'm out of time, um, but, and, and I did promise to be on time, uh, but I just don't want to leave without asking you a question about North Korea. Um, you, just before the G20, uh, built an alliance, if you like, an, an agreement, if you like, with, with the Chinese over your position on North Korea. Why would you not consider North Korea a threat when they've fired a missile that came close to Russian territory? Well, we, <laughs> I cannot say that we are not considering uh, a threat what is going on on the Korean Peninsula because of what North Korea is doing in gross violation of the Security Council resolutions. Uh, this uh, not very uh, noble attempt to present us as appeasing North Koreans, as acquiescing with, with, with what they have been doing, uh, I don't know the, the, the purpose of those. Maybe, again, to get some uh, political points, uh, to score some political points. Uh, our position is very straightforward. We supported consistently all resolutions of the Security Council, which were designed uh, to stop uh, the prohibited nuclear and missile programs of North Korea. And it was agreed from the very beginning that all these sanctions would be targeted to make it impossible to continue with these programs. The people who have been engaged in these programs, who are engaged in these programs, the people who um, provide finances for this, you know, the, the targets of the sanctions must be related, must be linked uh, to what has been prohibited by the Security Council. When uh, proposals have been put on the table, um, basically designed to completely suffocate North Korean economy, prohibiting any 
imports from North Korea, any exports into North Korea, any transport link with, links with North Korea, prohibiting any contacts with anybody of any importance in the leadership of North Korea. We cannot obviously support this kind of approach because it contradicts the basic premise, and the basic premise being that we have to stop nuclear and missile programs, but we cannot do this at the expense of hundreds and thousands of lives of North Koreans. By the way, and I, your basic I, premise I, being I, you don't believe in regi regime change. Uh, Just a simple no, Russian. Look, we policy. don't believe in regime change anywhere. I hear uh, very enthusiastic voices in the United States, including in some parts of this administration, that uh, the patience has been uh, over uh, and uh, they must do something because the threat is growing and growing and intercontinental ballistic missile uh, was launched. By the way, we provided to the US uh, on that very day when the presidents met in Hamburg, our military provided to the Pentagon uh, our objective data we received from our radars located just on the border with North Korea and according to that data it is not an intercontinental missile uh, but the Americans say they have their own uh, calculations uh, and we suggested just to sit down without any politicization professionally to look and to exchange information uh, but uh, a month ago, I think, uh, a month and a half maybe, uh, Secretary Mattis, answering a question, bluntly stated that the use of force against North Korean regime would mean a disaster, a humanitarian disaster in the region. And uh, they accept, our American colleagues accept in private discussions that it speaks about uh, hundreds of thousands probably not just uh, in North Korea, but uh, in South Korea and the neighboring countries. And uh, those who uh, keep those scenarios in their minds, I believe they are not, they're not responsible as politicians. Therefore, parallel, parallel with the continued pressure on North Korea, not instead, but parallel with the continued pressure on North Korea, Russia and China proposed a parallel political track uh, the idea is to uh, ensure a double freeze. North Korea suspends all launches and all tests. Uh, and in response, the US and South Korea uh, do not cancel, but reduce the scale of their war games uh, in that region, uh, which we believe uh, could help uh, diffuse the situation and allow for some uh, professional discussions to build up confidence, starting by very simple things, say, you know, uh, adopting a statement that no one is going to attack each other, that the security of each of the uh, participants of this process would be mutually guaranteed, uh, and so on and so forth. And then building, impo building upon these uh, universal principles, uh, trying to um, agree on some details which would translate these guarantees to all participants in practice. It will take time, but uh, we believe that this is the only way uh, to save us from, from a, a disaster which is looming. Okay. Thank you very much, Minister. I've, I think I've probably gone over time, which I promised I wouldn't do, so I apologise for that. We're actually, Natasha I knew, and I... I knew you would. That's you knew why I, I said that. 30 minutes, well, not, I feel... not 45. Yeah. <laughs> I feel bad about that. Natasha and I are actually going to North Korea in, um, at the end of August, so uh, we'll, we'll see what we find there. But um, thank you. Thank you, thank Who would you. be your interlocutors?